Hello, my name is Kathleen Lugrich, and I'm the Director of Programs and Education for the Army Historical Foundation and your host for Army Artifacts, a program that demonstrates Army history can be found everywhere. Today, our guest is Chris Sibner, the curator at the Poe Museum in Richmond, Virginia, and our topic will be Edgar Allan Poe and his time with the United States Army. Chris, thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. Can you start by telling us a little bit about the Poe Museum and why it's in Richmond? Because as a lot of us know, Poe has ties to several towns and cities, including one of my native Baltimore, um, to celebrate his memory and literature. Well, the Poe Museum has the world's finest collection of Edgar Allan Poe stuff. We've got everything from the socks on his feet to the hair in his head, but it's not on his head anymore. We've got his childhood bed. We've got things from all throughout his life, his manuscripts, letters, a reference library here. It's kind of a world center for Poe studies, but it's also a good place to take the family. And the reason it's in Richmond is because that's where Poe grew up. He was orphaned here at age two and grew up with foster parents. He ended up spending more of his life in Richmond than any other city. So although Baltimore is where he died, they have the corpse there. His mm -hmm. spirit is here. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot of Poe's life right there. Um, I think I started to giggle when I heard Poe's socks are there, and I, I might want to see Poe's socks. Got to check them out. <laughs> now, on to Poe's short-lived career with the Army. Chris, do we know why he joined the Army in the first place? Well, he was 18 years old. He'd run away from home with the grand dream of becoming a poet. There's no such thing as a professional poet in America back then. You were either, you had family money, you had a professor job, you were a lawyer. And Poe had been to college for one year studying to become a professor. He wanted to study ancient and modern languages but he dropped out because he couldn't pay his bills. His foster father didn't give him any money. He started gambling to raise extra money. So when he ran away from home, that was his game plan. I'm going to become a poet somehow. And he failed. And then he looked back, who's my favorite poet of all time? He said, Lord Byron, the British poet they called mad, bad, and dangerous to know, who famously went off to join the Greeks in their battle of independence. And Poe said, why don't I enlist in the U.S. Army? And part of that, had had a little bit of experience. He'd been on the honor guard that escorted the Marquis de Lafayette around town. And the, the math actually makes sense. Lafayette was a teenager when he came here during the American Revolution. So here was Poe meeting Lafayette on his return visit to the state. And Poe got to erect George Washington's battle pen from the Virginia Capitol grounds. They guarded that. And then they escorted Lafayette around town. And people think maybe that's what really inspired Poe, got him really excited about, you know, this chance for military glory. I've met one of the great figures of the American Revolution here, and maybe I could go on to greatness. And Poe's first book, published right about the time he enlisted, was Tamerlane, and that's about the real-life Turkic warlord who conquered most of Asia. So that's maybe where Poe's mind was. That's just not where the reality was at the time. You know, being so my next... is a little bit different than going off and conquering the world. But now the question is, are you listed as one of the Virginia 250th sites that people now have to come see because Poe literally had a brush with the Revolutionary War history? No, not yet, but we should be. You should be. Right here. I mean, Benedict Arnold and his troops went right down the street, right past us. There was a girl living in the house who actually said she saw Benedict Arnold invading the city from the window of our little house here. So we've got a lot of connections to the Revolutionary War. In fact, our yep. little house used to be called Washington's Headquarters. And back in the 1890s, had a big sign outside that said Washington's Headquarters. They told you this was his headquarters. Only later somebody said, you know, Washington wasn't in Richmond during the Revolution, so it probably wasn't his headquarters. It's like one of those many places George Washington slept. Hmm. That's okay. 250th is a big anniversary and we can all share the large collective stories. And I don't think anyone was going to connect the dots to Edgar Allan Poe until just now. Well, maybe they should. And his mother's buried five blocks from here at the hmm. same church where Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. All right. So everyone, Richmond, got to go. Got to see... The church got to see this house got to see this museum lots of things now we know that um he was an enlisted soldier 
And also it's very interesting that he later became a cadet at West Point. So he enlisted in Boston in May in 1927, and served with the first regiment of artillery at Fort Independence. But do we know what he did exactly during his enlistment? Yeah, he was an artificer mainly. He mixed gunpowder and explosives, a very technically demanding job. This was the height of technology in Poe's day. They had to make sure that the projectile had just the right amount of explosive in inside of it, enough amount of powder. They had to make sure that the, the wick was just the right length. If it's too long, it might not detonate when it's supposed to. Too short could blow up in your face. So in Poe's job, this was a very dangerous time. And a lot of artificers end up with missing legs or missing arms or very short careers, but Poe seemed to really excel at it. He had a really technical mindset. He'd studied algebra and physics, and he sort of knew what he was doing. And he quickly rose up to the ranks. He went from Fort Independence down to Fort Moultrie in South Carolina, then up here to Fort Monroe. And get this, in two years, he made to regimental sergeant major and took an average of 17 years to do. This was really a big deal. So. He thought, you know, I'm kind of chummy with my officers. And a lot of the enlisted men back then were the poor and the immigrants. And here was Poe, who'd been to university, who spoke Greek and Latin and French. And he was sort of on the level with the officers. And they helped him get out of his enlistment. He hired a substitute so he could go to study at the United States Military Academy at West Point. And there was a professor at West Point who checked for the roles 10 years before Poe and 10 years after Poe. And he said no other enlisted men had entered West Point. So it was kind of a big deal, kind of an unusual thing. Because there's that big class divide, but Poe really considered himself part of the upper class or the officer class. And officers were gentlemen. They were of the planters were. And he really thought this was his means to achieve a certain status and you'll never guess how he came to the money to hire a substitute he didn't he couldn't pay him so he never paid the guy that got him into more trouble but yeah even oh, no. so old, you see records of people hiring substitutes to take their place yeah. so post hired this guy bully graves to take his place and serve his enlistment for him for 75 dollars it would have been 75 dollars to be paid but it wasn't and Getting into West Point, he had his foster father knew Powhatan Ellis, who was a U.S. Senator, and he wrote to the Secretary of War and also General Winfield Scott, you know, big name in U.S. military, mm -hmm. Winfield Scott in the War of 1812, the Second Seminole Wars, Mexican-American War, even an advisor to Lincoln during the Civil War, but that's after Poe's time. But Scott helped him get into West Point, and that's how Poe ended up there. Wow. And the only reason he left his enlistment to become an officer is because he saw himself as being part of that class, like being an officer, being a gentleman, a little higher yeah. class than an enlistment person. Now, for those of you who don't know, to get into West Point, you need to be between the ages of 17 and 23. So you can be a little older than high school age. And Poe was 21 when he started. Uh, but today you also have to pass various medical and fitness exams, have an above average high school or college record, as well as good SAT or ACT scores. And you have to secure nominations from either a service connected source like volunteer work or from a congressional source like Poe did, a uh, representative or a senator to get you in. And Poe started in March, 1830. So what, what do we know about his time at West Point now that he's training to be this officer? We know that he decided pretty quickly that hey, this is a lot harder than my enlistment. And he decided he didn't want to be there. But fortunately, we know that's kind of study, the kind of things he was studying. We have pages from a textbook that Poe was using there. And we know he's studying physics and astronomy and check out some of the- He drew those? The solar Earth. system that they knew of back then. So very technical studies there and he seemed to really excel at it even even excelled at mathematics and algebra and of course languages he already was proficient in french and latin are these pages from the textbook or things he drew these are pages from the textbook okay gotcha 
So it's just showing you wow. the kind of stuff he was studying while he was there. Mm -hmm. But also, since he didn't want to be there, he, he wrote to his foster father back home in Richmond and said, you know, I really want out of here and I can't resign without your permission. So please give me your permission so I can resign and leave. And he said, if you don't give me permission, I'm going to get myself kicked out anyway. So Poe stopped showing to class, disobeyed orders. A, an officer told him to go to chapel. He said no. And eventually he got himself kicked out. But the cadets there loved him. They said he's a funny guy with a great sense of humor, like to pray practical jokes. The problem is a lot of these practical jokes we get later. So he was there in the 1830 to 31. So in the 1860s, there's an account of how he convinced the cadet to cut the head off a chicken and put the chicken in a canvas sack and carry on this bloody sack and a bloody knife. Pretend he just killed somebody and chopped off their head. They said stories about how he'd you know, sneak off campus to go to taverns at night. And there's even stories that came out in the 1920s, so 90 years later, about how he's told, don't forget to wear your sword to drill today. Don't forget to wear your sword. And he doesn't wear nothing but his sword. <laughs> so the, the stories get embellished over the decades, so we can't tell you what's true. And I don't <laughs> think much of any of them are true. But he's also had a reputation for writing witty verses, making fun of their command officers behind their backs. So he could have gotten in trouble just for this, but he kept doing it and developed a reputation. So some of his fellow cadets said, you know, you're a pretty funny guy. You're a great sense of humor. Why don't we all chip in and pay for you to get a book of poetry published? And we got that book right here. It's inside a little bookcase there. But it's this little book. And the wow. cadets at the time complained about this cheap paper cover. They're expecting something nice and leather-bound. Mm -hmm. They're chipping in like a dollar twenty-five each back in a really nice book to get for 50 cents. And the cadet who owned it was from Kentucky, so he looked up him, Benjamin Harden. You can find it right there. And he wrote, this book is a damn cheap. <laughs> All that fills 124 pages could be compiled in 35. <laughs> and it said that the cadets were so disgusted by this book. It was so awful. They threw most of the copies in the Hudson River just to get rid of them. And instead of that funny poetry they thought he was going to publish this has a bunch of poetry about death like the sleeper oh the lady sleeps soft around her but the worms creep so it's a love poem out of decomposing corpse with worms crawling all over it not really that funny so more familiar and, than the poe we know yeah this is the poe we know and what's cool about this is that he published two books of poetry before this they're long mm -hmm. poems 400 line poems this is the Poe we recognize. So mm -hmm. West Point helped make him into the Poe that we recognize. These are some of the early great poems, like an early version of The Sleeper, an early version of Lenore. So some of the things that would become great poems later came about when he's a West Point cadet. Unfortunately, since I hate it so much, they probably would have given him a good beating, except he'd already been expelled. And another weird thing about West Point, and this is something Poe writes about in his letters, is that he was spreading the rumor that he was Benedict Arnold's grandson, which is not a good thing to do anywhere, no. but especially not at West not Point, where he tried to hand over West Point to the British, and here he is, mm -hmm. you know, spreading that rumor, even though he, he must have known it wasn't true, but he seemed to delight in it. It made him look like more of an outsider and a bad guy. He wanted to be mad, bad, and dangerous to know. So that was kind of the end of his military career. After West Point, he left, he got his book published, and for us it was like he kept the great coat he used to wear. Mm -hmm. And you can see it in some of the photos. There's a couple of photographs where he's still wearing his West Point great coat decades later. And he's always very proud of his association with the military, except he embellished that. I tell you, he embellished things from time to time. So we do have a manuscript on display here where he's writing his autobiography for somebody who wants more information about him and he says that after he graduated first in his class at the University of Virginia you know instead of dropping out after the first semester mm -hmm. he took off to Europe and fought the Greek Wars of Independence but was captured in St. Petersburg Russia was rescued from Russia and he went all over Europe and he came back here it's all made up so Poe didn't get a chance to join the Greeks but he told people he did and one last thing that's kind of weird connection that 
after he knew he was out of West Point, he knew he was getting expelled, he asked one of the officers at West Point to put him in touch with Lafayette. The Poles were fighting for their independence, and he wanted to join the Polish army to help them gain their independence from Russia. It, it didn't work. Lafayette never wrote him back. I don't know if they even sent that message to Lafayette. But Poe, for the rest of his life, also bragged about how his grandfather had known Lafayette. And he, he loved those military connections in his life, especially ones connected to the Revolutionary War. Well, I don't know if anyone would send a message to Lafayette from Benedict Arnold's grandson. Might not yeah. look very good for them yeah. if they take that letter or if they wrote it. Um, but there's one other thing we know that's been connected to his time at West Point. It was a uh, Netflix released a movie back in 2022 called The Pale Blue Eye. I saw it. Um, a lot of references to his poetry, but you just told me that I didn't know it was based on a book. Oh, yeah, there's a novel from 2006 by Lewis Bayard called The Pale Blue Eye. So it's just based on that. And it's set during Poe's time at West Point, and Poe is a character who's sort of assisting the detective. So after that, I think one of the officers is named Thayer, and there really was an officer named Thayer at West Point, but pretty much That's everything it. they're just making up. <laughs> and what I do like about it is that Poe in the movie is skipping class so he can help out the detective. And in real life, Poe was skipping out in his classes. And eventually that's what got him kicked out is gross neglect of duty and disobedience of orders. So that, that sort of fits. And also in the movie, the actor playing Poe probably didn't look like it, but he was 30 years old. And when Poe went to West Point, he was, as you mentioned, 21. So he was a little bit older than the other students there. And they used to rib him for being the, the old man. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of your viewers probably can't make sense of that, but when you're 18 years old, a 21-year-old seems pretty old. Oh, yeah. Wow, I'm never going to be 18. I'm never going to make it to 21. No, I think that's true today. Everyone, all my niece, my younger nieces and nephews are like, oh, I'm so old. I'm like, you can be quiet. Yeah. Um, so, wow, this has been so much army related Poe. I don't think anyone expected it, especially me, but knowing that the cadets thought he was funny and trying to imagine, you know, all the cartoons and stories and parodies of a Poe character under this depressed gray cloud, trying to think of him being a prankster is hysterical. Although the part with the chicken in the bag and a knife kind of fits. Yeah that image of Poe. That one might be true. But what does the Poe Museum have coming up that we should check out, besides the fact that you're going to add yourself to the Revolutionary War tour? Well, in the spring, we've got our Illumination series coming back, and once a month out of the garden, we have speakers come and talk about different aspects of Poe. So we've got Mark DeWisniak, who's just written a Poe biography, and we hope to have Stephen Mako, who's done stable isotope analysis of Poe's hair to tell us what his diet was like, may rule out some of the theories about how he died. So he's always a fun guy to have around talking about Poe hair. And then we also have starting in April, every month from April through October, we have the unhappy hour. It's kind of like a happy hour, except it's here. So it's miserable. So you can come here and join us in despair. We have a cash bar and food and live music. We just had the Embalmers out here. They're a band that plays you know, sort of punk rockabilly while dressed up like morticians. And we had a big Poe birthday bash back in January. And we had the Coldhearts who come out dressed as Poe and do a bit. So there's ne always something going on in here, but the big annual events, the Poe birthday bash in January, the unhappy hours all throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And then, of course, you want to check out all of our exhibits to see what Edgar Allan Poe's socks look like. Now, can people see uh, his West Point book if they, like, book ahead of time or go to the library? Yeah, just go ahead and make an appointment. You can see it. We also have facsimile editions of it here. So this is in our library. It's a facsimile edition that looks just like it, except it's a fake. So we got... <laughs> Because I did go online thing. and saw that it looked like real copies were going for hundreds of hundreds of dollars um, just to find something. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so we it's good couldn't to know if we can get these it. things today. 
Mm -hmm. the, the reason we got these is because back in the 1920s, there was a collector who decided, I'm going to give all of my library to the Poe Museum. So we got a lot of these first editions, which would be completely out of our range today. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank Chris and the Poe Museum for joining me today to talk about Poe, his army career, and some of his early poetry. If you'd like to learn more about the Poe Museum, please visit their website at www.poemuseum.org. And if you like this program, please click like and subscribe. You can also support programming and the Army Historical Foundation's mission by donating to armyhistory.org. Thank you for joining us.